Hey you geeks, Megan Whalen Turner is the queen of Atolia, second in her Queen's Thief series, is a delicious morsel for a rabid fangirl to snarf down because it is a love story like no other. This is the story of a love that flourished in a time of hate. Mixed in among all the other elements of a great intrigue epic fantasy. If The Thief was Turner's spin on The Hobbit, then this book is like her telling the horse and his boy from the North's perspective, but the happy land of Narnia is replaced with the backstabbing land of Atolia, and Arkenland is politically savvy and pissed that this new treaty will have them surrounded. From the American commander of Bastonia to the German commander. Nuts. Nuts. At the very least, both are tales of divine intervention as gods walk these lands and reshape the destinies of our main characters. Other than that, it's kind of an awkward fit, and from that awkwardness, Turner creates her own story, which I absolutely love. As the thief hinged on one all-encompassing secret that changed everything, the sequel has two. So let me break down its characters, world building, and plot. Spoilerifically, you have been warned. Eugenides. The common problem with middle grade and young, young adult fantasy is that their young protagonists often succeed by bamboozling the adults with prodigy level skills in a certain area. And the thief is no exception. Turner did put in the work to explain why young Eugenides was such a prodigy, giving him exceptional training and when that failed, the gods' favor. So how do you keep narrative tension in a sequel where the protagonist is practically perfect at his chosen profession? Turner has a rather elegant, if brutal, solution to that. Destinies decided by an act of war, which lays out the groundwork for a great Grecian-style doomed romance. Now, going into this book, I knew that Jen and the Queen were OTP in the long run, so I didn't necessarily buy Turner's midpoint or trick of having us think that Jen was going to kill Atolia with his little cannon maneuver. But Turner still had little gems that I had missed on my first read, like Jen's discussion with the Magus, which appears to be about Sunus and Edis, but is actually about something entirely different. It makes sense why Jen, the thief of Edis, would not openly wish to discuss his, his wishes to marry the Queen of Atolia until it was politically expedient for his country. He's also like 16 going on 17 in this book, so his emotional maturity isn't all there yet. You're fraternizing with the enemy. The enemy! Thus, Jen's arc isn't about him being the greatest thief in the world. It's about him learning to live with a handicap and learning to live with puberty, something I'm sure most YA readers can relate to. Jen's arc is beautiful as he learns to rise again from failure and even succeed where he once had failed. That is the kind of story that I love to read, and that is why Eugenides is one of my favorite protagonists. Atolia. I was surprised at how much we got of her perspective this book. Last book, she'd just been an aloof evil queen who Jen totally hated. It's still cliche, I won't say Yet, despite Jen's feelings towards her, she'd seemed nice enough 
giving him a bed and free means to escape the first time she captured him. I thought their political marriage was going to be super easy, barely an inconvenience, until she exacted a harsh judgment for his larcenous behavior. Do you know what the penalty is for stealing? No! With that, Turner convinced me that Atolia hated Jen, and I would have to wait a whole nother book at least for this relationship to ever reach the OTP potential that the fandom had promised me. Until suddenly, Atolia chose Jen's earrings. And even more amazing was the day she realized she truly loved him back. Looking back, there were, of course, hints all the way that were not spelled out. The whole book, Turner has the reader wondering, how can an evil queen love? How can an evil queen love an enemy prince? How can an evil queen love an enemy prince whose hand she's cut off? These are the sort of questions that rabid fangirls like me devour. And these are the sort of questions that Atolia had to ask herself in order to grow as a character. I love him. He's not proud. I was wrong. I was entirely wrong about him. Atolia, like Jen, began this book as a master of deception, which is a good skill for a queen and a thief to acquire, yet it's a terrible skill on which to base a healthy relationship. So Turner digs deep into these characters so that they can find truth and love on the page and in each other, giving the reader something delicious to devour. Though it should be noted that my male reading buddy does not get this book. Probably Men never get this movie. I know. Edis. What is even more elusive last book for the fact that the entire plot was for her honor. Her increased page time this book allows the reader to see again that she treats Jen like a younger sibling. But I'll always love you like a brother. I wouldn't want it any other way. This relationship dynamic, which had been clear from the end of last book, Turner pairs with the misdirection that Eugenides hates Atolia and wants her dead at the midpoint. Thus, the center of this book doesn't feel like ye old tired love triangle or actually a love square, where Eugenides likes Atolia who seems to like the mead and Atolia likes Jen who seems to like Edis based on the rumors that Edis spread all throughout the land. Edis, of course, spreads these rumors because she hates Atolia and is certain that the feeling is mutual. Mutual, I'm sure. Yet Turner fleshes out these queens to be much more than just two teenagers fighting over a man. Rather, Edis has the stability that Atolia desires, while Atolia has the beauty that Edis never believes she will attain. On top of which, there are the political powers of the Thief of Edis, and that he is, in fact, a 16-year-old CIA operative, who is an asset that the queens can fight over without breaking the Bechdel test. That Turner can write a male hero who is chosen of the gods, being perfectly balanced and even swayed by two fully fleshed out queens, is a marvel of writing and is why this dynamic works so well for me when other attempts have failed spectacularly. World building. The Medes have come bearing gifts. A gift? Gift? What gift? And Atolia is right to be worried. 
or as the Medes reveal themselves to be just as conniving as the Magus said they would be at the end of last book. Turner takes her time with a few well-placed scenes to further flesh out the fairy tale as kingdoms from last book, once painted with broad strokes as good and evil based on the temperaments of their rulers, we now see the individuality, with even the Meade's perspective from Comet the Slave not being a completely evil monolith. We also see a variation in the courts of Edis and Atolia. Edis that was painted as the good kingdom is now so ready to leap for war that she skips right over a diplomatic solution. I'm thinking it's past time for a rumble. For an all in, all out, once and for all, winner takes all, high noon shootout at the Open Corral Rumble! While Antolia is just trying to keep a tight rein on her barons for the good of her people, why Atolia's barons are so set on destroying their own kingdom when there are other nations that they could destroy remains to be seen, and I don't think it needs to be discussed in detail in this book. It's not like I was worrying about the greater geopolitical situation as Eugenides was being led back down the mountain in chains to his supposed demise. Turner just built enough of the world to firmly establish that these two nations were at war and these two lovers were doomed. Two lovers forbidden from one another War divides their people. Turner even scrapes this bonus level in her narrative as the waging of peace proves to be just as difficult, if not more so, than the waging of war. And now our two star-crossed lovers are stuck smack dab in the middle of their warring factions. You're, God, you just, you know, Wonderful. But I just don't see how this is going to work out. Through this all, Turner's strongest suit has been her ability to plot. The ancient Greek myths of gods intervening in the lives of men to give them their heart's desires rarely have a happy ending. Paris and Helen's love burnt Troy to the ground, while Dido's love for Aeneas also met a fiery end. So I was pleasantly surprised that Turner's YA romance book began with blood and fire and the wrath of the gods. It's a age and culture spanning story. Which, as a rabid fangirl, I love. But I can admit that there is a problem. Having a particular fondness for enemies to lovers. I'll save you from the pirates. Or the doomed lover trope. You can't even break your own spell. But you don't understand. I love you. You're too late. With the more drama, the better sometimes creates relationships that are truly toxic and not healthy to fangirl over in hindsight. Speaking of that, let me know down in the comments what my Spring Fling video should be. These are videos where I explain a non-canon, somewhat unhealthy relationship to the greater fandom. In years past, I've covered Zutara and Kleshwi, this year, I'm leaning towards Matt and Elaine, so let me know your thoughts. Astute readers will notice that Atolia's royal colors are blue, while Atolia herself wears red rubies, and Jen also wears red garnets to match her. The Mead wears green emeralds like a jerk. Turner gives us all the doomed lovers drama, while somehow keeping this relationship non-toxic. We get the dashing kidnapping, which is also a daring rescue. 
Oh, come on, Robbie. Climb the castle walls. Sweep her off her feet. Carry her off in style. And then Eugenie proposes life or death to her with no expectation that she would actually accept. If she had refused him and he had to drown her, do you think he would have drowned himself next? Yet she accepted, and then the Mead intervened, allowing her to renew that acceptance free from Eugenity's control and of her own free will. Then we get a grand sweeping, if not battle, then at least military exercise. This is an epic fantasy after all which places our characters on the road towards peace, though the story keeps going to wrap up all those little threads of everyone getting over the fact that they thought they hated each other. Time out! Let me get this straight. You know her. She knows you. But she wants to eat him. And everybody's okay with this? Did I miss something? <gasps> It is there in that final chapter that we see the hands of the gods at work, wanting Edis and Atolia not only to be united against the Mede, but in the face of nature herself. This book not only brilliantly covers the enemies to lovers trope, but also wrestles with questions of free will and destiny and teenage angst all which bubble up in the final scene of Eugenity sacrificing a goat and demanding answers of the gods. A place where I may have once been kind of sorta as a teenager, although no windows were shattered in my emotional breakdown. For Eugenides, at least, the gods answer him and wonder of wonders allow him to live happily ever after with his love. God has made a man today. Until, of course, the next book when he becomes the king of Atolia. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you want to see more. And let me know your thoughts down in the comments section. See you next week. Bye.